Well, the game's afoot, for I have found another cannon, the design of which is from the age of Nelson, and yet it's been refitted for the modern battlefield. Well, the relatively modern battlefield. And all conveniently situated outside a Victorian prison. The perfect cannon. Now, why am I always talking about cannons? I've talked about this on the channel before, but you can always read a cannon. You can learn so much about the country that produced them, the industrial power it took to make them, the technology and the know-how to design them, or perhaps just the money to buy them. You can learn about the army that used them and the campaigns before that prompted the building of them and the ways in which they were used. I think it's incredible to use a cannon as the lens to view history. And they're too heavy to put away at the end of the day, so everyone just leaves them outside for eccentric historians to talk about. So let's go see this cannon. Now, I'm in St. Albans, the old Roman city of Verulamium, and it was the site of the martyrdom of the first Christian martyr in Roman Britain, St. Alban. And we are here, out in Hertfordshire, and this is the gatehouse, the old gatehouse and governor's house at the front of the old St. Albans prison. And when this was restored, they're doing a bit of digging around here. They found, ah, they found this cannon. And I'm rather high up. So I'm gonna turn the camera around and you'll see this is absolutely massive. It weighs 5,800 weight or about 6,500 pounds. The barrel is about nine feet long. That's about three meters for those of you measuring in French. And guns like this would have seen service in the British Army and the Royal Navy all over the world. This is a heavy gun. It's huge. And so it's not a field piece. It might have been brought up for sieges. We see the garrison carriage here. It would have been used in fortresses. And most famously, it would have been on the decks of the great ships of the line. HMS Victory had 30 of these, 32 pounder, 5,800 weight. This 32 pounder is such a prime example of late 18th century, early 19th century military technology. They were able to produce so many of these in cast iron. The back of it is reinforced to hold heavier and heavier powder charges that the ball might fly straight and true. The more powder is all that you have to increase the velocity and thus increase the accuracy. So they tried to reinforce the back here. And yet in so many ways, this gun has more in common with Mons Meg at the top of Edinburgh Castle than it does with modern artillery. The coin, this wedge, is all that's used to change the elevation. It's made of cast iron, very brittle and prone to cracking and breaking under intense pressures. It's in a very antiquated looking carriage and the pomelion here and these rings were to hold ropes to be able to maneuver the gun around. And yet this gun holds a secret behind that tompion. Behind the tompion is not cast iron, but a wrought iron sleeve, because this is a rifled muzzle loader. Now we know in traditional artillery, black powder artillery, that is just a simple tube. A smooth bore is just that bronze or cast iron tube, smooth all the way down. And so the only way we can increase the accuracy is to increase the velocity adding more powder or making the ball smaller or perhaps uh, trying to stabilize the ball so adding a sabo or lengthening the barrel but as the 19th century progresses and we get towards the victorian era new technologies are developing 
There are new metals available, new machining available, and there's a lot of changes happening in artillery. Um, rifling is becoming the new standard of the day. And so when we get to the Crimean War and the Civil War, you start to see the artillery being rifled and that increases the range. And we see all sorts of new projectiles being developed, explosive shells of all kinds. It's just an incredible change. And then we see um, fortresses being improved and eventually iron being added to ships. Thus, we need to further increase the abilities of our cannons to be able to punch through armor and to increase the velocity of those explosive shells. And so there's this leapfrog of technology. And we also see the development of breech loading artillery. And rifled breech loaders would make their way onto the field in the 1850s and the 1860s. But as time went on and they were used in the field, they didn't always perform well. And the first time that the Royal Navy really used them was uh, in the Anglo-Satsuma War and the bombardment of Kagoshima. The Satsuma clan had done something naughty, and so the British came to Kagoshima to return the favor and return a bombardment. If you want to read more about that, Josh Proven has an amazing book on the British in Japan in that period, and I'll put the link up there. But the performance of the Armstrong guns, these rifled breech loaders, was abysmal. A huge percentage of the guns misfired or killed or wounded its crew. And a huge percentage of the actual shells fired. They fired about 400 shells and I think nearly 50 of them failed or misfired in some way. And so the thinking started to turn away from this finicky new technology, this expensive technology. And again, we're at a pivotal change in military technology. There are all these hundred gun battleships. This was the standard of the day to have a gigantic row of 32 pounders. And so there were thousands of these 32 pounders lying around. And so the bright idea was to bore them out, insert a wrought iron rather than cast iron sleeve that could handle that heavier powder charge and could be machined to have grooves, to have rifling. And thus, the rifled muzzle loader was born. And we have guns like our gun here. And so they were put onto ships where they also didn't perform terribly well. They were put into uh, garrison duty all over the world because there were so many of these fortresses that needed guns. And so many of these guns didn't leave service because they were just a great placeholder. And a lot of them had very intricate carriages. Some of them were put into disappearing gun carriages. It was the Moncrief system. They could fire above the fortress and be loaded and fired um, without the men being exposed too much. And they saw service all over the world from about 1870. And this particular gun was a, it's, it's a 32 pound, we gotta give it credit. It's a 32 pounder from the 1840s. So there are a few changes to the likes of HMS Victory's 32 pounders, um, but it was rebored in 1877. And so it is the middle of the Pax Britannica. There were not many engagements that the rifle 64 pounder would have seen, but it is an incredible piece of technology and it shows you the problem solving that happened at the time and the many different technologies floating around and what Britain was able to do with a bunch of old guns. It's like someone repurposing all the military surplus rather than just selling them off. So I think this was, was great. The rifled muzzle loader 
defended against an enemy that never came. Perhaps the French always could be the French. But um, guns like this served all over the world. And it still has some interesting, interesting and unique features. Now, when this began life as a 32 pounder, of course, it fired the 32 pound solid shot. And by land, it fired the case shot canister for those that got too close. And by sea, of course, it fired all the nautical ammunition, the chain shot and bar shot, and grape shot, famous at the Battle of Trafalgar, of course. And as a 64 pounder, it had a completely new class of ammunition. It also had a shrapnel shell with a bigger bursting charge for softer targets. And like its predecessor, it had case shot for if things had gone awry and people had got too close. <laughs> so whole new class of ammunition. And with rifled artillery on the field, things were completely changed. You cannot underestimate how much rifling changed modern warfare and with rifled infantry weapons, rifled artillery weapons, the battlefield was completely changed forever. It's the flat trajectory of the rifle, it's the incredible range of the artillery that develops into the trench warfare that we see of the First World War. And so many of the features of modern warfare that we know today. And so it all begins here, with the rifled muzzle loader. Now again, behind this tompion would have been that wrought iron sleeve with the rifling all the way down. This is the front sight. There would have been a front sight that's screwed in here. There is the rear sight, and the rear sight would have screwed in here. And your sights are still very important. This is still an era where you're using direct line of fire. There's no indirect fire artillery like we have in the First World War. This is still, you still have to look at your target to fire upon it. Other features of this modern piece of technology are the uh, reinforced carriage. And you can see the design here. There were all sorts of carriages. And I love that on the Moncrief system, you would have had these two mirrors that kind of operate like a trench periscope where you would line up the two sights using these mirrors and make sure you're aiming the gun correctly. But this one is our traditional garrison carriage and it would have seen service in a fortress somewhere in Britain. And now it stands here to tell us a little bit about Victorian technology. And a company called Hunting Gate did a lot of the restoration work, really beautiful restoration work, and they made a very, very subtle tompion. Very subtle indeed. Well, that was our 32 pounder, our 64 pounder, our 5,800 weight Victorian stopgap. What is our modern stopgap? What are you going to come up with? What military technology should we? dig out of storage, rebore, and repurpose. Let me know in the commentary. And look here. It's Victoria Square. Victoria. God bless her. Anyway, I am Daryl, known in genteel circles as the Lord Rivers, and this is the Ministry for History.